Hi, and welcome back to the Program Noted Podcast. I am your host, Nikki Purdy, and I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Uh, I sit on the board of directors for the Newark Symphony Orchestra. I chair the Education and Outreach Committee, and I am NSO's principal bass player. Here with us today, we also are lucky to have Simeone Tartaglioni, the one and only music director of the Newark Symphony Orchestra, also the music director of the Delaware Youth Symphony Orchestra, and the head of the instruments, uh, orchestral instruments division at Catholic University. How bad did I butcher that, Simeone? Very good. <laughs> orchestral instrument and conducting. As a conductor, I, I care about that a lot. <laughs> I'm going to nail all these one time, I promise. Viewers keep coming back and see whether or not I nail the intros at some point. We also have with us the wonderful Russell Murray, who also sits on our board of directors. He is the um, head of the early music program at University of Delaware, where he also teaches music history and is the music director of the Chesapeake Brass Band. Yes? Yes, absolutely. Right on all counts. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. We have a wonderful program coming up this May. Oh, my goodness. How exciting it is. We have a brand new, not quite brand new, but a very modern percussion piece being done by NSO's percussion section. We have our concerto competition winner from last year coming back to perform with us this year. We're so excited to have managed to coordinate with her and get a spot for her in this, in this season's program. We have a Coleridge Taylor string piece and a Gno wind piece. So this is quite the program. Um, let's start off with everyone's classic favorite Bach. Russell, tell us, what would the experience of hearing a Bach concerto live have been like at the time? Well, if you want to really experience Bach the way it was experienced then, the first thing you need to do is, need to do is pour yourself a cup of coffee. Because when Bach was in Leipzig, he was, uh, he was head of what was called the Collegium Musicum. And uh, it was a group of uh, professional instrumentalists and uh, university students who would get together on Friday nights at a coffee shop and they would would play the latest um, concertos that that uh, either Bach had written or some of Bach's colleagues had written uh, so it was a it was a very different kind of atmosphere than what we would normally expect that actually sounds like a lot of fun that sounds, it does. That energy here sounds it great does. so what about the piece itself what should you know our viewers, our listeners, be looking for in this piece? Well, it's, it's pretty typical. Um, the concerto at that time was, like a lot of concertos in later times, was a three-movement form. And so the outer movements were usually in what's called ritornello form. And that is the orchestra, and the orchestra usually included the, uh, the soloist, him or herself, uh, would play an opening idea and then would turn it over to the soloist, who would play you know, a nice extended, very free kind of thing. And then the uh, ritornello would come in again and again and again, sort of like pillars on a bridge that would support the concerto all the way through. So you'll hear that form both in the first movement and in the last movement. And in the middle movement, it's just uh, a stunningly beautiful melody that you'll listen to. It's one of my favorite of, of his slow movements. Absolutely. And, you know, Bach played around with his pieces a lot. He wrote this as a violin concerto, but later he completely redid it as a harpsichord concerto. And he did that a lot with his with his pieces. You have a good melody. It's worth experimenting oh, with. But you, you also had a great bass. You know, you are a bass player. You, you yeah. will see that. In the second movement, that it is almost ostinato continuo, palm, palm, yes. palm. It's just like you know, um, in many ways, it is a, like a, a religious belief. You know, God is there with every you know bells you hear. It, it's really a memorable second movement. I think it's one of my very favorite second movements. It is. Fantastic. We have a wonderful soloist playing this piece with, with us. Um, her name is Viva Jenna Karaman. And Simeone, you've worked with her before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was uh, in the Delaware Youth Symphony Orchestra a few years ago. Now it's not there anymore. And um, uh, she won the concerto competition with Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. So we were planning to do Tchaikovsky. Unfortunately, the pandemic is uh, changing a lot of plans. So. Um, we delayed her performance as much as we could, but 
before she moves uh, away from the area, uh, you know, I said, look, we cannot do Tchaikovsky because we still don't have all wins and brass in one place at this time. But um, can you do something else just for violin and strings? And so, of course, she turned to Bach. And that, that was, I think, a wonderful choice. And so finally, she can perform with us. Spectacular violinist. Um, she's uh, so interested also in Indian music. She's uh, originally the family from India, so she has a, a direct connection to Indian music. And I told her, I want to know more because I want to perform some more Indian music with, with, with dif different aesthetics and things. So I'm very excited to have her back. She's a wonderful person, a wonderful musician. Absolutely. She's been very flexible in the scheduling with us since last season, which has just been, you know, very, very much appreciated on this end from the education and outreach perspective. So thank you, Viva, for being so flexible with us. We are excited to have you perform with our orchestra. Um, we have some other really wonderful pieces on the program. We have a very cool percussion piece um, happening on this program. It is by a living composer named Evan Chapman. It was composed, I believe, in 2013. So it's very modern and it's cool. It's for four players. I want to talk a little bit about this because as a person who has taught general music, I love one of the instruments that is called for in the orchestration of this piece, which are boom whackers. So if you don't know what boom whackers are, they are giant colorful tubes made of plastic usually that are tuned to a specific pitch. So if you hit a surface with the pitch in this piece, what it's called for is um, like a sawhorse type of situation or like a two by four on a stand, you can actually hit with them. They produce a pitched tone. And it's a really neat effect when you have multiple players using them. It's a very blue man group if people are familiar with that. Um, it's a really, really neat technique and it creates a really interesting sound palette. So. I'm excited about this piece personally. I love a good percussion ensemble piece. Um, trying to find bio information on Mr. Chapman was a little bit difficult. So Evan Chapman, if you see this podcast, send us your bio and I will make an addendum video to this podcast with your bio information. That would be great. Um, but I think that's gonna be a really neat piece. We also have coming down the pike, a wonderful Coleridge Taylor strings piece, Simeone. I want to ask you about Samuel Coleridge Taylor because he's a super interesting guy. He yeah. was a mixed race Englishman, basically. His father was a doctor from Sierra Leone and his mother was an English woman. Um, and he's a black composer at a time in history where we have lost a lot of the oeuvre of black composers. Tell me about his life. Yeah, in many ways, it was surprising to me when I started to learn this piece. I, I tried to get as much information as I could to understand better. And somehow my idea was that at that time, a black composer was probably uh, somehow, you know, in a corner, not in the middle of the music history. But actually, he was in London, a super respected musician. So... His figure was central, his talent extraordinary. The, the number of compos he died very young at 37 years old, and the number of compositions are really remarkable of all kinds. And then also he traveled, he was called the Black Mahler. He was conducting, he was performing. He came to America several times, and he got so much success with people dedicated school to him, choirs in his names. and. Um, uh, he met the president, I think Roosevelt was at the time, I don't remember, but anyway, he met the president when he was here in America, and when he died, the, the music society in, uh, in England was so uh, worried about um, the sort of the, the family, because he had children, of course, and because he sold the, the rights of some of his most famous composition, he didn't make any money out of it, so they, they started all the process of the copyright for musicians, somehow it's connected to the Coleridge Taylor. So in many ways, a lot of composers later on, they owe to, to him and the friends around him who tried to protect his family. So he got a pension or something. So in many ways, um, he was really embraced fully in the music society in England. And uh, another element, I think, of uh, extremely contemporary um, note is his daughter, was a conductor and a composer 
really that time, you know, you, you would think a female composer today is when a conductor today are the ones, you know, that is normal, but she she was, I think was born early 1900s, so that, that was really long time ago. She, she died, I think, in 1990, quite old, and she was fully a conductor of a great success. So uh, the piece we are performing is the novelette number four. Uh, he wrote four of them, and these are just for strings. Um, and uh, what I like in this piece is there's a lot of energy. So uh, the, the, the different uh, areas of the piece are so well balanced. Even the keys, actually, it was quite interesting. When I was playing at the piano this uh, um, score, it was interesting how we went in one key, all of a sudden we ended up in a very far one. So you can tell the personality of a person from the choice of their harmony sometimes. So it was adventurous. And um, somehow we can call in a sonata form. So there are two themes, a recapitulation, but um, it's adventurous. It's a piece that tells you how far it could have gone if he only would have lived a few years more. It's really a tragedy that only 37 years old, a genius of this caliber, and it was gone. Mm -hmm. Well, another interesting thing about his life, um, as you said, he came to the United States three times, and he met a lot with African-American leaders uh, and became involved with W.E. Du Bois and the Pan-African movement, and it turned out he was he sat on the at the first Pan African conference was the youngest delegate, um, but he but he was very interested in um, looking at different aspects of his African roots and and his visits to the United States sort of spurred that on and he wrote a number of pieces that were based on on African ideas. That's really neat. That's super cool. I'm glad we're playing Coleridge Taylor. I think um, is a composer who again that just really interesting and wide oeuvre of music again in that in that short lifetime there's there's so much to be done with his music i think we should do more coleridge taylor in my opinion um awesome we also have rounding out this fabulous program we have a strings piece we have a concerto we have a percussion piece we also have a winds piece um so we have a gano winds piece so we only tell us about this piece Oh, it's such a gem. I need to thank Bonnie McDonald. She was the one who proposed the piece. I'm honest, I didn't know it. So I said, oh, wonderful, sound good, oh, it's great. And then when I started to study it, I said, oh my God, this is great. The melody, the freshness of the melody. I, I don't know how, it, there is a melodic beauty typical of Gounod, his opera, fantastic, but you, you can see even some Schubert there, some energy in the rhythm like Mendelssohn. Um, and in many ways in history, this piece uh, has a little place in itself because he wrote the piece for um, a group, a famous group of wind players in France. Um, they were developing new techniques and advancing the repertoire and the possibilities of wind instrument thanks to some new devices and probably you know, uh, Rasta knows better than me, but they had the new devices, new construction, I think the BAM uh, technique. So this instrument had new possibilities. They were, from an international point of view, more stable. The range, I think, was more satisfactory. So it's like a dream for a composer. All the sides say, can you write a piece, but the instrument is so much better. So you can write something that is so much more adventurous than what the regular pieces were until that time. So it's a piece in four movement. There is a slow introduction in the first movement and then an allegretto. Um, I think the allegretto needs to be more allegro, so I push a little bit the tempo farther, but everybody so far like it, so I no, no complaints officially at least. So um, the second movement is a beautiful aria, I would say. Uh, and it is mostly dedicated to the flute because the flute at that time was the person who he dedicated the piece because it was the leader of that uh, ensemble. So the flute and the oboe have the most uh, melodic um, importance in the second movement. It's a slow adagio with really gorgeous, gorgeous melodies. Then we have a, a typical scherzo that looks like somehow the energy of a Mendelssohn. I really think... Really, yeah, it does have that. It does have that. Edge. I think, you know, Mendelssohn Italian or... Uh, 
a lot of energy. So there is plenty of this, uh, you know, fast, light, and energetic. Uh, the last movement is a beautiful, you know, grand finale with a lot of notes, fast, and um, every instrument is really treated like solace. So everybody has something to do all the time, and there is great balance in between the instrument and the players. And then they start doing a wonderful job, really. I'm so impressed how they, you know, react to this piece and how much they practice and how fast I can go. So, yeah. you know, we were talking about temp. You know, usually you don't, don't conduct a chamber piece with nine people, but since, you know, they say, no, no, you should conduct. I need to, you know, make sure that they're okay with the temp I want to do in a piece that is more a chamber music piece. Well, and this is a petite symphony in two ways. I mean, it's petite because it's a small group. You've got the octet. Um, plus the the flute, uh, and at the same time, it's it's a little symphony. It's a little a little Haydn, a little Mozart symphony. The same arrangements of movements, the same basic style. The musical language, of course, isn't isn't Mozart or Haydn, but it has that very almost neoclassical approach. And it's a shame we we um, Gounod was a, was a very prolific composer in almost every genre, and and we know him for what three things, right? Faust and Romeo and Juliet. And the Ave Maria that's based on the uh, uh, first prelude of the Well Tempered Clavier, and that's it. So it, I'm I'm really happy and, and thanks to Bonnie, yeah, for uh, for getting this on the program. I'm curious now about his symphony number one and number two. It looks yeah, like he had two completed symphonies. So I'm gonna look into that. Maybe we should do it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I wanna I wanna third the Bonnie McDonald shout out. Bonnie McDonald is a national treasure. And we are so lucky to have her on our board and in our French horn section. It would be fun to get Bonnie on the podcast. We should. Yeah, we should do that. We should. <laughs> yeah, give this, give this podcast a thumbs up if you want to meet Bonnie McDonald, the national treasure. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I wanted to also just like point out one thing that you said to me, because I think this is really interesting for, you know, people who enjoy symphonic music and enjoy going to the orchestra, but don't necessarily aren't super well versed in the part of music history that involves the evolution of the instruments themselves i wanted to highlight you brought up a really interesting point that at the time that this piece was composed which was i believe right at the end of the 19th century um there was a big shift going on in the way that instruments were made and how they were designed which allowed composers to start doing really new things with ideas around harmony and dissonance just because the instruments were more more consistently able to play in tune um yeah russell Beckham, i would say mostly we talk about wind instruments i think the strings were set yeah long before you know we you know italian violins cello they were you know state of the art for a long time earlier so that was a a great moment for the winds and brass, especially that raised to the level of a um, accountability and proficiency that that the string had a little bit before. Yeah, it, and it was a real competition. Um, as part of the industrial revolution, there were always these um, big uh, expositions, almost like world's fairs, and and there would be competitions, and and uh, instruments would uh, the companies would bring their latest model of instruments and and you know they'd win a gold prize or silver prize and they'd find some way to use that to help their advertisement but that kind of competition brought real innovation and real um, finesse to these instruments mm -hmm. i mean they started out life with no keys or maybe one key and and now by the end of the 19th century they have this incredibly complex and precise um, structure of keys and rods and all sorts of things when you said they started out with no keys, my immediate thought was trying to fathom playing bassoon without any keys. It's well, so it had a couple of keys. <laughs> yeah, a couple of keys that inherited that from the Sean, but um, not too many. And it's it's tricky. Um, yeah, I work you with... can in Vivaldi bassoon concertos that are so hard today. Yeah. How the young girls were able to yeah. play that. He had geniuses over there. I, I did that one recently, and then the solo said, you can't believe how hard this is with all these keys. How they were playing that thing about this time? <laughs> yeah, uh, I had a student, um, I guess eight, nine years ago, who who did one of the Vivaldi concertos on a Baroque bassoon. And it's, it's, it's a challenge, you know? 
Yeah. I, have, I have so much respect for bassoon players, especially yeah. the ones that are willing to take on any sort of concerto related anything, because there's a, and I'm saying this as a bass player, I think it's an exceptionally difficult instrument to play. Um, well, yes. excellent. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. Do either one of you have any other thoughts you want to add? I just yeah. want to thank, oh, sorry, Russell, go ahead. Okay. It's going to be a, it's going to be a really great concert. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody in NSO. This is officially the last concert of the season. Even we may have some surprises in the summer, so stay tuned. But I really want to thank the board of the NSO, all the players, all the people around who made all this season, crazy season, possible. Nikki with your podcast was fantastic. Eric and the videos, all... NSO is really the example of what means love for music, how people go beyond anything possible and imaginable to really make things happen. And it really make my heart full and really is emotional for me to see the love of music towards NSO by its member, the audience, his players, the board and all the committee members. It's just really unbelievable, guys. So um, thank you, all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys both so much. Thank you to our fabulous orchestra members. I I love this orchestra with all of my heart. And I also want to thank all of our viewers, all of our patrons, all of our audience members, and ever, anyone and everyone who has ever supported our organization. Thank you for that support. Um, if you can, please consider supporting our orchestra financially. At this time, we are bringing all of our programs to our audience free of charge this season to bring music into our community and keep our our you know musical doors open to those who enjoy our orchestra and who enjoy music so if you can please consider donating you can also support the orchestra with affiliate links which are available at our website thank you for being here with us today Simeone and russell and thank you dear viewers for being here with us today thank you thank you